Looks like we're good to go there. Um, so again, what is Regenix? Helping patients avoid invasive surgery. And really of all the different things we put out there, you could consider this the most comprehensive deep dive uh, in a video format uh, with regard to what is Regenix and, and what do we do. Uh, just some housekeeping, any references to the Regenix C or cultured stem cell procedure refer to an independently owned and operated facility in Grand Cayman that licenses our technology and where our physicians see patients who require that more advanced technology. That particular technology is not FDA approved for use in the US. Um, it is approved for use down in Grand Cayman. So what we'll discuss, uh, the basics of platelets and stem cells, uh, who we are, uh, interventional versus surgical orthopedics, uh, where does Regenix fit versus everything else? The basics of our procedure, what other types of procedures are out there being offered? Uh, patients and data for each body area, uh, I'll go through them all, and we'll wrap it all up. So the basics, everything we do is autologous. This means it's your own cells. So these are, we're not using anyone else's cells here. And we offer a broad array of regenerative procedures uh, from platelets and different types of, of platelet uh, rich plasma or other platelet type products to stem cells, uh, same day procedures, cultural procedures. So we do a lot, not just sort of PRP and some same day stem cells. We do different kinds of platelet procedures and different kinds of stem cell procedures. On the platelet side, we really offer two main things. One is platelet-rich plasma, which is concentrating blood platelets to help enhance repair. The other is platelet lysate, which is breaking open all of the platelets to get all the growth factors out and using those growth factors uh, that are immediately available for repair. Now, we're going to switch gears now and talk about stem cells, and there's a little background uh, here for you to understand a little bit more about stem cells. When it comes to stem cells, there are adult stem cells, there are embryonic stem cells, and there are induced pluripotent stem cells. So those are the three main kind that are out there, and we're focusing only on adult stem cells, and again, only on your stem cells. As far as definitions are concerned, a simple definition is a stem cell is kind of a blank slate or undifferentiated cell that's held in reserve in your body until repair or replacement is required. Uh, it can also turn into many different cell types. And curiously, it can also orchestrate a repair response. So if you look at a simple construction site metaphor, Platelets are a bit like espresso shots given to the workers to make them work harder and faster. Stem cells are this curious mix of a general contractor who can recruit more subcontractors to the construction job. And when all of that's done, can uh, turn into the bricks and mortar. So a very strange concept for us. Now, we offer two different kinds of stem cell procedures. One is the same day, where the cells are harvested, isolated, and re-implanted, all within the same surgical procedure, usually within one day. The other is a culture procedure, where the cells are harvested and then grown uh, to bigger numbers, and then either used or cryopreserved for future use. So let's start with who are we? Um, you may have seen us in lots of different media outlets. Uh, we've been on The Doctors twice, been in Life Extension, Good Morning America, Good Housekeeping, et cetera, et cetera. And that's because we're the original orthopedic stem cell procedure. There isn't anyone else in the United States that even comes close to having done this work longer than us. And anyone else that makes the claim that they've been doing it this long is frankly not telling the truth. In 2005, when we started this work uh, in orthopedics, there was no one else doing it. We were it. Uh, and uh, now these days, there are others that have started doing this. But again, we've been doing this uh, the longest. And to date, we've treated thousands of patients. Uh, this is the, uh, the counter from this month off of the website and the number of Regenix procedures that have been performed. 
since we started. And as I'll share with you later, we're very, very proud that we've published a lot of research in this area. So we've known this a long time. We've treated tens of thousands of patients. Now, we're going to first start with a 30,000 foot view of orthopedics and stem cells. Then I'm going to come down to uh, a 10,000 foot view, and then kind of our rubber meets the road. So I'm going to start really high level first. What we're really talking about here tonight, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this when they start hearing about stem cells or platelets, is that we're talking about a new field of interventional orthopedics. Interventional orthopedics I'll describe to you, but first let's start with surgical orthopedics. Now, surgical orthopedics isn't doing all that well right now. You know, we have taken as faith that all of these surgery procedures that our athletes get, that a lot of patients get, are really effective. But in fact, as we start to go through this outcomes research process of the last 10 years, we found that many of these procedures aren't effective that we thought were. So again, large studies have shown that the most common elective surgery in the United States, which is knee arthroscopy for debridement or meniscus tear, is no better than a fake surgery, meaning it's no better than a placebo surgery, which is really concerning because we have lots of people that still undergo these surgeries. They believe they're effective, but you can just go Google this and look in the New York Times uh, for articles that will show you that these are not effective procedures. In addition, we see all sorts of crazy stuff coming out on nip or knee and hip replacement prostheses. Now, I gotta tell you that the one that I saw today that was just published recently, and it just came across my desk today, is freaky. Um, here we have a hip replacement prosthesis, the most common that's been installed over the last 10 to 20 years, a polyethylene type. And what's really fascinating is some researchers looked at the impact of that prosthesis versus a ceramic prosthesis, a newer one, on the stem cells that were in that area and in the muscles. And what they found was an 80%, 80% drop in the natural stem cell population in polyethylene hips that you didn't see in ceramic hips. So that is really disturbing. We don't even know what we're putting into people's bodies. This was just published last week. We are just finding out now that a lot of this stuff we're throwing into people's bodies is really dangerous junk. And that study is just earth shattering. It should be basically on all over the national news right now, and I have no idea why it's not. We also know that fusion for the spine and other joints just overloads other areas leading to quicker arthritis. So it's like playing a game of dominoes there. And tendon and ligament surgeries really aren't all they're cracked up to be. They're, they're not as successful as we once thought they were. So because of biologics or what would be called orthobiologics, you know, platelets, stem cells, and new things we can't even imagine yet that are coming down the pike, we're going to see radical changes in what orthopedic care means. Now, in 2000, most of what happened for patients that failed physical therapy or still had problems after physical therapy was surgery, with very, very few injections being performed. Then, by this year, we're already starting to see things like platelet-rich plasma reduce the number of tendon surgeries. We're seeing a dramatic reduction in tendon surgeries simply because something as simple as concentrating the patient's platelets and injecting that into really angry or partially torn tendons is just as effective, if not more effective, than surgery. So we're seeing a switch already. And I think over the next 15 to 20 years, we're going to see it flip. We're going to see most of what is considered uh, valuable orthopedic procedural care be injection-based and not surgical. Arthroscopy will still be used, but it'll be much, much less common. Uh, joint replacements will still be used, but they'll be isolated to things like uh, serious trauma, where there's no way to salvage a joint. 
And eventually even that will get replaced by joints being bioprinted uh, using your own stem cells. So if stem cells can allow for needles to do really cool things, how important is it that we have an accurate injection? And that's an important topic because what we see is that there's three kind of levels of accuracy in stem cell injections. One is blind injection. So that's about half of all the doctors still out there. And I'll give you a great example just from today. We saw uh, Dr. Schultz actually came in and, and kind of grabbed me and he saw a patient today who had a rotator cuff tear. Now, we fix rotator cuff tears all the time with stem cell injections. But this is a guy who didn't want surgery, so he went to his orthopedic surgeon and said, I don't want surgery. The orthopedic surgeon injected what I call baby juice, um, which I'll get into, amniotic fluid. Um, there's no stem cells in this stuff. The doctor thinks there's stem cells because he was told by the rep that there are, but there's not. And he did this as a blind injection. He didn't know how to use ultrasound wasn't interested in learning how to use ultrasound to get into this area. So this was done blind, as if he had a blindfold on. He had no idea where he was injecting this stuff. Of course, it didn't work at all for this patient, so the patient is coming to see us. Then we have low accuracy guided injections, and that's mostly what's done out there. These are doctors who have more training. They are doing things under fluoroscopy, or which is x-ray guidance or ultrasound, but they're just kind of generally parking it into a joint. They really don't have a high skill level uh, or sophistication about where it's going. And then we only have about 5% of all doctors doing any kind of injection work that do precise guided injections. And that's all of the doctors on the Regenix network. So what is a precise guided injection? Well, let me show you one right here. This is an uh, x-ray guided injection. Uh, that is injecting the superior labrum. Uh, this is for a slap lesion tear in the shoulder. And what's really fascinating, again, is the accuracy of this injection. You see the needle placing the contrast and then that the stem cells following that as the contrast wash, washes out exactly into the superior labrum. Now, you can't do that blind. You can't even do this one under ultrasound because you can't see the superior labrum with that technology. Um, so again, there's only a handful of doctors in the country that can pull this procedure off, and it's many of our Regenix providers. So how about surgery plus stem cells? And our question is why? We're, we're in the midst of a revolution where surgery, for the most part, is going to be replaced. It's going to be considered antiquated in 20 years. 25 years or 30 years from now, we're going to look back and say, what were we thinking? Why were we uh, doing all this when we didn't need to? Um, so again, there are times when patients do need surgery, but it's the minority of the patients we see, not the majority. Um, and it's the more minority of the patients who are currently getting surgery. So in short, we represent a new medical specialty, what we call interventional orthopedics. And that's very different from stem cells or us that you see out there. Uh, just some guy who decided for financial purposes to take a weekend stem cell course and, he, and you're going to be the, the lab experiment while he does this procedure on you. Uh, not us. We don't do it that way. Our goal is nothing less than to create a medical specialty that will replace most of, it, of the existing surgical orthopedics in this country. And we're doing that through very, very precise highly accurate injections that are less invasive and consequently uh, have much less downtime associated with them. Again, the successor to orthopedic surgery, what will replace most of what we know today is orthopedic surgery, uh, not the complement to it, uh, although there'll be some things that are complementary, and not just some schlocky thing where I put IV stem cells in your arm and kind of blindly inject it in your knee and call it good. So now let's go to the 10,000 foot view. So where does Regenix fit versus everything else? Well, probably best to start with what we're not. We're, we're not a bedside centrifuge, and that's what you see here on the left. So uh, generally what happens is that if it, when a doctor wants to start dabbling in stem cells, 
or platelet rich plasma, he buys one of these machines. And really all the doctor knows is where the on button is. He really doesn't know anything else about stem cells. He took a weekend course about generally how to use the machine and generally maybe some basic things about stem cells. Um, and he knows that he puts it in the little kit thing and he puts a little kit thing in the machine and he closes the top and he pushes the on button and he comes back in a little bit and you get something out of that, but it's not a highly sophisticated way to do stem cell work. So all of our doctors have their own in-house labs so that they can do this with a level of precision, care, and accuracy that you just can't get out of a bedside machine. So we're not that. On the other side of the equation, and sometimes mixed in with this, are the weekend stem cell courses. And they're all the rage right now. Docs are taking these courses. Uh, they're literally weekend courses, usually a day and a half. Um, you'll go in. You'll get taught some basic information. But as you might imagine, medical specialties aren't taught in a, in a day and a half course. So these guys don't know a lot, um, and we're not like that at all. Uh, number one is anyone with a, with a driver's license, a heartbeat, and a medical license, and, and not even check for a medical license half the time, can take a stem cell training course on the weekend. Um, we're very, very different, as you'll see, see. We handpick our doctors. We refuse to let certain physicians on the network because they don't have the base training, and then we train the heck out of the folks on our network. So we're not that. And we see emulators pop up every day. I guess uh, uh, emulation is a form of flattery, so we're flattered. Um, but there's lots of folks trying to do what we do, but no one has the depth and breadth that we do to do this, as I'll show you. And to show that to you, I'd like to just bring up this Wendy's commercial. It's one of my favorites from the 1980s. Uh, you may remember this commercial if you're my age or, or older. Uh, this is when uh, Wendy's had the Where's the Beef commercial, where this old lady over here on the right keeps yelling, Where's the Beef? Um, and again, I think that's really the mantra for tonight's presentation, Where's the Beef? So the regenics process is quite different. What we do is we innovate in the lab. We perform clinical research. We track patients in registry. We use data to guide treatment decisions, and then we publish that data. Not, again, what's generally being done out there. So on our clinical research, uh, we have tons of publications. Go on our website. You'll see about 15 publications, uh, three or four this year alone, uh, on what we do and various registry data sets. We have three different randomized controlled trials that are ongoing right now. Uh, one that has finished recruiting for knee osteoarthritis, one in shoulder rotator cuff tear, another one in knee ACL tears. We have the world's largest patient registry. We're tracking thousands of stem cell patients that have been treated all the way back for a decade. And we have a full-time biostatistic bio staff that focuses on looking at all of that data and trying to figure out what can it teach us about how to do this better and better and better. Other clinics, just not there. Um, they're not publishing. They're not keeping this registry data, which is incredibly expensive. They're not looking at the biostatistics of what they do. Um, they're just treating patients. So let's look a little bit at, you know, two things. One thing that's really cool about this slide is that each one of these little circles here represents a clinical study that was done since 1997 all the way through 2015. And as you can see, you see more circles as time goes on. So that's good. That means there's more research. Now, this is all the bone marrow stem cell research published in orthopedics. And what's amazing about this is, is about 5,500 patients. If we add up all the patients that are in all these studies, there's about 5,500 of these, have had their results reported after a bone marrow stem cell injection for orthopedic purposes. And that's pretty amazing if you think about it, that you know, we have a lot of people saying, we don't have enough research in this area. And yet we have research going back to 1997 
on about 5,000 patients who have been treated. So we do have quite a bit of research. There's no doubt we need more. That's why we spend so much time uh, publishing. Now, the other thing that's cool about this slide is that since that time, 28% of that number of patients, or about 1,500, are our patients. So we're very proud to say that we've published 28% of the world literature if you look at the end of patients. And you know, I'm highlighting right now uh, our studies amongst these studies. Um, again, we, we've continued to publish, and we do so uh, often. So again, we're very, very proud that we've been able to advance the literature of what we know about stem cells and orthopedic injuries. Now, this was just updated uh, today. One of the more interesting things about this research world is that you see a lot, a lot of folks claiming to know a lot about stem cells and to be experts. But if you really look at what they've published, which is really how expertise is defined in medicine, there's not much. Um, so uh, right now, uh, we've published the most when it comes to unique patients in the literature. Um, Felipe Hernigal in Europe, who's published longer than we have, going back to the late 90s, a real pioneer and, and unbelievable stem cell expert in Europe, um, has published uh, the next greatest number when it comes to patients and, and studies on patients. Uh, Jay Wu Pak in Korea has done a great job. He'll be at our International our Interventional Orthopedics Foundation conference um, in October here in Denver. And we invited him because, and we didn't invite a lot of these other guys, because this is a guy who's taken the research thing to heart. He is publishing, and that's, that's admirable. And then if you go down the list and you try to look at these other folks to see if they've published anything, they haven't. So that's a, a good indication of expertise in medicine. On the lab research side, we have a state-of-the-art lab where we do our own basic science research. So you wouldn't be able to tell our lab from university lab um, on the research side. And we've used it to do all sorts of cool things. I'll discuss one of these here in a second. Uh, and other clinics, again, you're not seeing that commitment to the lab, primary lab research at all. Um, they're basically buying a machine from somebody. And again, they know where the on button is, but that's about it. So this is just a, a quick walkthrough of our lab here. I'm going to give this a second to, to come up. Looks like it just came up there. I'm hoping that you'll be able to uh, follow this along with me. Sometimes these video things can get a little choppy depending on your internet connection. But that's a fluorescence activated cell sorter. Uh, it helps us to sort cells. That's a PCR machine. It helps us to look at the gene and genes inside cells. Um, that's a inversion microscope, uh, looks at cells that are live, uh, various types of incubation there, normoxic, hypoxic. Um, that's a um, flow cytometer to identify cells in a population of cells. Uh, that's an inversion microscope uh, that uses uh, fluorescence, uh, so a fluorescent microscope. This is negative uh, 180 cryo storage uh, so that we can store cells. Uh, for future research use. Um, and this is the same type of technology we would use to store cells for clinical use down in Grand Cayman, or at least not us, but the, the company that, that uh, works with us down there. And then that's an ELISA machine. We actually just upgraded all of that into a multiplex uh, microarray ELISA. So again, lots of cool things that we can do in our research lab that you just don't see in a medical clinic. And obviously, all of our Regenix network affiliates benefit from that research. So, yeah, it might sound kind of cool that you know how to do this research, but what does that get me, the patient? Well, this is a really interesting uh, demonstration of what it gets you. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started to ask ourselves, is it possible to get more stem cells out of a patient sample, meaning that we have the same patient sample we used to. Can we get more cells? Are there more cells in there that we're just not going after? 
And the answer was yes, there's a lot more stem cells in there than most people know. And we were able to devise a way to get many more times the number of stem cells out of the same bone marrow sample. But more importantly, we were able to, to figure out fairly quickly that that greater number of cells was producing better clinical outcomes than before. So we were able to see that things like a functional scale was improving with the new procedure versus the old isolation procedure. And pain improvement was improving and patient self-report of, uh, of improvement was going up. So again, we, we were able to take something very quickly from the lab and to move it into patient care. So let's talk a little bit about our stem cell procedure and the basics of that. We take bone marrow stem cells uh, collected from bone marrow aspirate. We take an IV blood sample and the stem cells are isolated and can either be injected the same day, that's the SD plus procedure, or they can be cultured uh, and that's only available in Grand Cayman because it's not approved in, in the US. And they can be cultured for about two weeks to get more cells and to grow those cells to bigger numbers. Now, one of the things I often hear from patients is, isn't a bone marrow aspiration painful and awful? Because it kind of sounds awful, the whole bone marrow thing. But what's really interesting is that when you become an expert at numbing patients up and you know how this works, uh, we actually did way back in 2009, six years ago, well before most doctors had even heard the term, term stem cells, we ran our own little study trying to see uh, just what people felt. And about eight to nine out of 10 felt that this procedure was really no big deal. Uh, so again, not a big deal procedure. Uh, a lot of people end up thinking this is a big deal, but it's really very much like an advanced blood draw more than anything. So now that we've talked a little bit about Regenix, giving you some background of who we are, kind of what we do, how we do it, let's look at what else is out there. Um, what else is a possibility for orthopedic injuries? So we're gonna talk about three things, same day fat stem cell treatments, uh, amniotic stem cell treatments, I'll use the air quotes on that one and you'll see why, and Regenekine orthokine that's being done in Germany, and just a few places here in the US. So the first big misconception that I often see when it comes to uh, a, a liposuction type procedure, most people conceptualize liposuction as no big deal. You go in, you get a little fat sucked out, you know, it's like going in and, and taking your car in for a cleaning or something but really not the case. In fact, when we look at the complication rate of the smallest kind of bone marrow uh, aspirate procedure, the kind we use, versus the smallest kind of uh, liposuction, it's a pretty stark difference. That's the complication rate for a bone marrow aspiration, and that's the complication rate for a liposuction or a mini liposuction under ultrasound guidance. And if you have a regular liposuction, the complication rate is even higher. So again, pretty stark differences there in side effects. Now, the other thing that's different about bone marrow and fat is that we have 13 consecutive papers as of May of this year that show that bone marrow is better for orthopedic tissue repair than fat and no papers going the other direction. And then finally, there's this urban myth out there that fat has a bunch more stem cells than bone marrow. Uh, not, not the case at all. In fact, all of this, as you can read in my blog, is based, based on a fifth grade math error, meaning that uh, the fat stem cell advocates seem to have uh, misunderstood that there's such a thing called a denominator, the thing that's on the bottom of when you divide. And as a result of that fifth grade math error, they've made it look like fat's got a lot more stem cells, but it doesn't. And obviously our procedures obtain a lot more stem cells out of bone marrow than everyone else's, as I've discussed. So let's now shift gears to amniotic stem cells. When I first heard about amniotic stem cells, I was kind of excited. I was like, gee, this is great. Maybe 
through some regulatory loophole, we can get amniotic stem cells that we can purchase um, and that are approved through FDA uh, in a, from a tissue sense. They're not approved as drugs at all, but from a tissue sense. Um, so I was really excited. I, I in fact, uh, went and contacted a company that did this, and I asked them to send some samples. And the first thing I did, of course, was to want to test this in the lab because I wasn't going to use it in any of our patients until we really confirmed what the heck was in this little vial that came from the, uh, the company. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a couple of days before I got a call from a sales rep who told me that this vial contained all these stem cells. So I'm like really excited. So we tested all of this. And regrettably, <laughs> there wasn't any living tissue in the vial, nor were there any stem cells. And we've now tested a couple of these. And so here's the problem. You have a, a, a pretty little sales rep that brings this stuff in that tells the doctor it contains stem cells. The doctor puts on his website that he's doing amniotic stem cell therapy. Uh, and the doctor has no way to check that claim. But in fact, the doctor is in, injecting dead tissue uh, really without his knowledge most of the time. So this is not a stem cell therapy. When you see someone advertising that they're doing amniotic stem cells, um, it, it's kind of fraud. Now, it may not be conscious fraud. They may not have any idea that it doesn't really contain stem cells, but they were told it contains stem cells. It does not. So you're not getting amniotic stem cells. Now, it does contain maybe some growth factors. Uh, I call this stuff baby juice. Uh, as I talked about before, but who knows whether it works, doesn't work. It's certainly not a stem cell therapy. Well, you might have heard that Kobe Bryant went to Germany to get his knee injected. So what is that all about? That sounds kind of cool. You got to fly to Germany for it, or there's two or three clinics here in the U.S. that are doing it. Um, what is this all about? Well, it's Regenekine, so, or also called orthokine. And what's fascinating about this technology is that it's been in use by U.S. veterinarians for more than a decade, uh, mostly in the horse or equine world. And if you talk to a U.S. veterinarian, they'll basically tell you that this is a natural anti-inflammatory shot that lasts for about six to nine months. Not a stem cell procedure. It's not even a, as good as a platelet-rich plasma injection. Um, it's just a natural anti-inflammatory shot. So uh, if you were going to try something, go down the street and try a simple PRP shot in your knee before you go and spend a ton of money on Regenekine or Orthokine. And I say that because their own data from this 2008 paper that was published really shows that they're barely beating placebo here in mul at multiple time points. So again, if you compare knee arthritis outcomes to what uh, PRP studies have shown, just platelet-rich plasma, you'd be far better off getting a PRP shot for a fifth of the price than you would on getting Regenekine or Orthokine injection. So now we're going to talk a little bit about patients and data. Now, why do I put both here? Well, you know, what I find is that patients like to hear about other patients who have been treated. Uh, and sometimes their eyes gloss over when I start talking about data. Now I'm gonna to try to split the baby here. I'm gonna to try to talk about both. I'm gonna to try to talk about patient information and data. Um, and hopefully I won't put you to sleep too badly. But we have data for everything we do that we've collected through the registry. Um, we put that uh, information on the website uh, so that you can find it. It's under research. And in addition to that, we update this about once a year. So we're about to update all of this for 2015 this fall. Usually we do it in the fall of the year. So all of these things that you're seeing tonight will be updated fairly soon. The numbers obviously will all go up uh, as we update them. So who are our patients? Well, weekend warriors, active elderly, professional athletes, young athletes, traumatically injured, lots of different people. Let's first talk about safety uh, because that's, again, I think paramount in everyone's mind and it should be. So how safe is what we do? Well, there have been multiple different publications uh, 
on Regenix. I'm just going to go back to that slide for a second there. Um, and these are publications that we've published. These are publications that others have published about what we do. And they all show a very good safety profile. In addition, we also have forms like this on the web that you can take a look at that go over the safety profile. This is on more than a thousand patients for the same day procedure. So you can trust that we've looked at this very extensively. In fact, so extensively that our, our next safety paper will be on about 2,300 patients uh, receiving about 3,000 orthopedic stem cell procedures. It'll be the largest of its kind in any safety publication for any indication in human stem cell use. Uh, which we're very proud of. We've actually brought in an independent adjudication panel, uh, many of whom are university professors, to look at our work and to look at our safety uh, because we're very serious about all of this. So in general, from again popping up to a 30,000 foot view, what do we treat? We treat arthritis, meniscus and labral tears, ligament tendon tears like MCL, ACL, rotator cuff. So I'm going to start by uh, reviewing things in this order. I'm going to go over first knee, and then I'm going to go over hip, and then shoulder, and then foot and ankle, and then hand and wrist. And finally, we'll end up with spine. So if you want to go get a cup of coffee, take a little break, take a bathroom break. If you're interested about hearing about foot and ankle, that's going to come fourth. Knee is going to come first. Spine's going to come last. This will give you a chance to take a little break before I go to questions. So, knee. Uh, first, let's talk about some patient stories. This is a patient involved in uh, high-level elite uh, sports and basketball, women's basketball. Uh, she gets a meniscus tear. Father's involved in the healthcare industry. Pretty much knows if his daughter gets a meniscus surgery at 17, uh, she's going to get arthritis by the time she's 30 doesn't want that for his daughter, chooses a different uh, type of treatment, which is our Regenix same-day procedure. The focus here, again, um, was helping her avoid surgery, and this is you know, her statement. Uh, and on the other hand, this is just a mom. Uh, someone who'd had some kids said, hey, I gotta get back in shape, I wanna do a triathlon. Started doing a triathlon, couldn't do it because of some patellofemoral arthritis, and we were able to get her back to doing that. Uh, this is actually a professional football player, and he's got a riveting story uh, that we put recently uh, on the website. It's also on Facebook that just talks about his life and how he got into football and how we were able to help his knee. Um, but that's only the second half of the video. The first half of the video is equally uh, riveting because it talks about how he got into football, which is a great story. But this is someone who was toward the end of his career. We were able to give him another year, and he was very happy about it and has allowed us to talk about it. So this is now data, and this might put you to sleep, but I think it's important to discuss. Uh, first thing that's important to discuss here is this is not FDA trials data. This is registry data. Registry data means that this is information that was collected as patients were treated. So uh, it's on 1,000 patients. And what you can see here is this is the percentage improvement over time. Uh, and these are two different graphs. The top graph is patients reporting more than 50% improvement. And this is the mean or average improvement over time. And I don't know that I would actually believe these 36 and 48 month time points. They go up. And I think that's an effect, frankly, of losing follow up on patients out that far more than it is uh, that they're magically getting much better at three and four years out. I think we're probably not seeing much loss there, which is great, but I don't think we're magically seeing these things pop up. I think that's an effect of the way the data is collected. This is pain and function data on uh, from many different sites, 710 patients, showing that pain goes down over time and function goes up, which is consistent with what we see, but it's nice to be able to see that the registry information that we collect also shows that. And this is a really interesting thing. This is one of our uh, doctors in Chicago uh, who started to look at how does Regenix SD injection stack up to a knee replacement. He had collected a bunch of knee replacement data uh, many years ago, 
and he knew what that was. And so he used the same exact metrics to collect data on his Regenix SD knee arthritis patients. And this is the before and after function scores and before and after assessment scores. So you can see that the Regenix SD there, which is on the right versus the left, um, and those paired bars there is really doing pretty darn good considering it's being compared to a surgical amputation of the joint and uh, a replacement of the joint with a prosthesis. But what does our data analysis say about various how various things affect outcome? And I'm not going to really dwell on this particular um, slide. There's a lot going on here, a lot of information. But the bottom line here is that we look at all of these things. You know, does age affect outcome? It doesn't. Does being heavier affect outcome? It doesn't. Does having more severe arthritis affect outcome? It doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. So important to know that we're constantly looking at this stuff. And as I brought up before, there's a lot of claims by the fat stem cell crowd that fat stem cells are great and that must, that must really work great for arthritis because it's got a lot more stem cells, which it really doesn't, wink, wink. Um, but we've actually collected data on this. This is 200 patients done with bone marrow and fat. We didn't see any difference by adding in the fat um, in these patients. So can stem cells help ACL tears without surgery? Uh, now, we just talked about arthritis patients. Let's shift gears into really one of the more common sports medicine surgeries done today in the United States, ACL surgery. Uh, you tear your ACL, you go in and you get it yanked out, and a, a new one is put in. Uh, this is a uh, college football player who has allowed us to share his images uh, and talk about what we were able to do for him without surgery. This is the pre-stem cell picture showing this uh, really sinuous uh, ACL, and then a much better looking ACL post-procedure. On another recent patient, this is a, a really interesting one. This one's probably easier to see. This is a woman from Singapore who flew all the way to Colorado to get her knee treated because she didn't want ACL surgery. The orthopedic surgeons over there thought she was crazy. I thought it'll never work to put stem cells in that ACL. So we carefully seeded her own stem cells under very precise imaging guidance into this ACL. This, was, this one over here, pre-procedure, was read out as completely torn in need of surgery. And then three months later, she got this ACL showing this normal dark appearance. And the radiologist read the one out on the right, which was post-procedure, as normal ACL. So again, uh, some pretty amazing things. And we believe, we just published a paper on this. We have a second paper coming up soon. We believe that about 75% of the ACL surgeries done in this country currently are unnecessary surgery given this technology. Now that's a very, very strong statement, but I can tell you that's my belief on what I've seen on the before and after MRIs of these patients. So hip osteoarthritis, let's talk a little bit about hips. Um, and again, patient stories. On the left, this is a woman who was in a ballet troupe, and she knew that if she had hip arthroscopy surgery for a labral tear, it was all over. She was not going back to being a professional ballerina. Um, so she instead had us place stem cells precisely into her labrum under uh, guidance, and this is her uh, statement. On the right, it's just, uh, just an older guy that wanted to be able to ride bikes with his buddies, and he couldn't do that anymore, and, and you know, this is what he said. And this just gives you some idea of uh, our hip data. And what you see here is the Oxford hip score has this red line, so to speak, and, and above this red line, you're doing really good things for patients. Uh, and below that red line, uh, it may not work. So you can see here that we're generally beating that minimal clinically important difference for the Oxford HIP score. This is uh, 370 patients here. Now, one of the things that's important to note is that all things being equal, HIP patients tend to do a little bit less well than knee patients. No one's sh quite sure about why that is. Um, and so consequently, when we compare our same day to the cultured procedure, 
we, send to, we tend to see better results in the cultured procedure for patients with moderate and severe hip arthritis than we do with the same day procedure. And this compares those two. The culture procedure is the one down in Grand Cayman where the cells are grown to bigger numbers. And shoulder, uh, these are two success stories here. On the left is a two-time Olympian uh, who had really torn up his rotator cuff. And uh, he had surgery, uh, it worked for a while, then the whole thing just fell apart. He didn't want to have surgery the second time, uh, and this was actually our LA affiliate, uh, Andy Bletcher, who did a great job of using our procedure to help him uh, heal that ACL, and he was very, very, very happy with that. Again, no surgery the second time. On the right, this is just a woman who uh, was a Pilates instructor, had a labral tear with some arthritis who didn't want to do surgery. She knew that she wouldn't really be able to get back to what she loved with surgery. Um, so that's her statement. And this is the data presented a little bit differently here. You can see here that uh, I'm still on the bottom, you're looking at months after treatment, but now I've taken pain, function, and percent improvement rating and put them all into one graph. So you get a sense of what that looks like. And this is about 200 patients on data collected from 14 clinics around the country. So this is an MRI before and after, uh, showing a uh, you know, big tear here in the rotator cuff, uh, and then you don't see that tear after the procedure. Again, here, a big tear in the rotator cuff, you don't see that tear after the procedure. So now let's switch gears to foot and ankle. Um, again, in our patient stories, uh, a woman who just wanted to be able to walk on the beach. And on the right, a younger woman who wanted to be able to ride uh, competitive cycling, uh, both of whom were fusion candidates. Now, the problem with ankle fusions is that once you fuse an ankle, uh, you don't have any more motion in that ankle, and the, the forces go above and below. So they both wanted to avoid that kind of surgery. This is actually a Cayman Olympian that the Cayman government asked us to see who had the Regenix SD treatment for a stress fracture and small tears in the Achilles tendon, and this is her winning her own invitational after. Uh, foot and ankle, uh, this is some of the data there. Uh, not a huge difference between same day and cultured, um, and it gives you some idea of how those patients fare. Hand wrist, uh, these are two uh, patients who on the left was a professional writer, on the right uh, an interior designer. Um, one had the same day procedure, the other had cultured procedure. Uh, gives you an idea, these were both CMC or base of the thumb arthritis, or what's commonly called texting thumb. And this gives you an idea that there is a difference between, for this type of procedure, between the cultured and same day procedure. And now we're going to sort of start winding things up. We'll get to spine, then I'll do some closing comments, and then we'll take some questions. So if you have some questions, this might be a good time to start putting them into the question box off on the right. So uh, as far as patient success stories, uh, on the left here is a woman who just wanted to be able, when she got into retirement, to plant coral. Uh, she's a big scuba diver. She wanted to help do this uh, to help the effects of global warming on coral reefs. And she got to that point and couldn't do it because of her back. So we were able to get her back there. Uh, in the middle is a guy who's a professional climber who um, has a harrowing story on the blog of trying to rescue some climbers uh, in Nepal. And halfway through the, the, the rescue, he's thinking to himself, oh, my God, I can't believe I just did that. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that before those guys treated my back. So it's a really great story. And then on the right is just a, a mom who had some sciatica who wanted to be able to try to get back in shape, but her back was preventing her from doing that. So we also treat neck and upper back as well as headaches, just to give you an idea that we don't only treat low back or lumbar. And we've got a very broad spectrum of what we can offer, everything from different kinds of platelet procedures to same day stem cell procedures to cultured procedures. And what I find in disc stem cell work is that because of what's out there and because of some of the schlocky stuff that's being advertised, 
a lot of patients really are misinformed here. They don't understand that they might be a better candidate for a platelet procedure than a same-day stem cell procedure. Um, or they might be not realize that they're really not a candidate at all for a same-day stem cell procedure, even though they were told they were. So this is just some data that we collected from uh, our platelet lysate epidural. So this uses platelet growth factors uh, instead of a steroid epidural and compared steroid epidurals to uh, the uh, PL disc procedure uh, using platelet growth factors as an epidural instead of steroids. So it just gives you an idea of what that data looks like. And that's all available on the web if you want to look at it more closely. And this is a patient with a thoracic, um, some early thoracic stenosis. This is the spinal cord. These are the facet joints. And you can see the facet joints pushing in on the spinal cord. Uh, and then after the procedure, we were able to stabilize this area by treating actually some of the ligaments and those facets. And you can see much more room, which is the white stuff around the, the spinal cord. Again, no surgery for this patient, just injections. Uh, this is a patient with a huge uh, herniated disc, I mean massive, um, who would have gotten immediate surgery, um, who we were able to save a surgery. So this is, again, no surgery, just injections after. Uh, this is the statement of a patient who did need stem cells in his disc because he had a disc tear and disc pain. Um, and then some before and after MRIs from those kinds of patients a big disc tear extending into the disc, which is the white, which is bad. You can see much less white after the procedure. Also a, a marked decrease in pain, increase in function. So again, these are the kinds of patients that do well with disc stem cell injections that have tears in the disc and their discs are painful. This is a, another recent uh, patient for stem cells in the disc. This white area here, not good, not present after. White area here, much bigger, much smaller after. This is the side view. Again, you can get a sense here of what can happen with these disc tears with a stem cell injection of the disc. And those are generally patients that do very well with stem cells in the disc. And then this is actually a different procedure down in Grand Cayman where we're placing the cells uh, into certain areas of the disc to try to get rid of a disc bulge. And this is actually backwards. I, I, I apologize. I set this one. Back, backwards here. This is the before on the right. So this is a, a five millimeter disc bulge, and this is the after on the left, now down to about half that size, about a 2.6 millimeter bulge. And this is just the enlargement of that area without the uh, annotations on it. So you get a sense of what it looked like before on the right and after on the left. So let's wrap it all up. Uh, I would really spend some time watching our videos. I think you'll really enjoy those. We work very hard to try to make very complex uh, information as easy to understand as possible. Um, I would also consider reading our book. I mean, uh, the book is really how we think. Um, it's in its third edition. It's a number one bestseller in Amazon and orthopedics. Uh, it's been downloaded tens of thousands of times, tens of thousands of copies in print. And I think it's a really great way to understand about this stuff at another level. And we also have a lab engineered stem cell support supplement that's based on a year of lab research. Um, so we didn't just schlock together some supplement based on some papers that someone else did that kind of maybe fit what we were trying to do. We actually did this research in the lab and this is actually one of the, the pictures, the fluorescent microscopic pictures or for us at my microscopy pictures of uh, collagen being formed uh, with aggregan and SOX9. Those are all cartilage components. Uh, and in this case, we were trying to see which supplement at which dose helped cartilage form. So again, we didn't schlock this together. We spent a lot of time researching this. And then we have two other supplements that we also sell. Uh, these are all things to try to reduce uh, inflammation. This statement uh, applies to the curcumin based on a recent research study that was done. Uh, and we also have a concentrated fish oil. Uh, 
And again, the focus here are just focusing on supplements to try to either improve cell health or to try to reduce inflammation. Because in our experience, patients with a lot of inflammation don't do well with stem cell procedures. And yet when you take things like Motrin um, or Aleve or Celebrex, that tends to reduce uh, the activity of stem cells. So we need anti-inflammatories for our patients to take that won't hurt stem cells. So what to look for in a clinic? Obviously a protocol that's used an awful lot, guidance to take in place cells, a clinic that's doing a lot of outcome research, constantly innovating, collecting and publishing data, and has a bunch of its own research publications. And when you should run, a clinic that treats every A through Z disease. So if you see a clinic that's treating BACs and also treating ALS and Parkinson's, run. If you see a clinic that's you know, treating uh, knees and offering cosmetic procedures and treating erectile dysfunction, run. And the reason why I say this is that it takes a lot to put together a good protocol for one area of the body and certainly a lot to put together a good protocol for just one type of tissue, cartilage or tendon or ligament. But the concept that you could somehow do all that and get really good at treating Parkinson's and really good at uh, treating everything that ails you is just not credible that promises extremely high success rates that are too good to be true, uh, high on success stories, uh, short on data, uh, that states that their doctor took a stem cell fellowship from the A4M, this is largely a scam. Basically, these are docs that take weekend courses and claim to have uh, taken a whole fellowship. As far as we know, there's only one orthopedic stem cell fellowship out there right now, and that's ours. Um, it's a full year um, where we train physicians how to do these procedures, and they spend uh, half of that time doing basic research and publishing studies. Uh, the physician is not an MD or a DO, um, so we're seeing lots of chiropractors and naturopaths get involved, and I've got no problem with chiropractors or naturopaths. But my big concern is that when it comes to procedures that are this precise and specific, uh, you're not in the bailiwick of those providers. And the clinic just opened but claims to have treated thousands of patients. This is our provider network. We screen the heck out of these guys. We also screen them based on the fact that they know a, a basic set of skills, which right off the bat uh, excludes the vast majority of people that are interested in working with us who don't have the basic skills to do this kind of work. So in conclusion, Regenix isn't magic stem cells, it's advanced and precise interventional orthopedics. We've been doing this longer than anyone else and we put more into publishing our results and stacking the deck in our patient's favor than anyone else we know. So I'm gonna take some questions now and I will try to get to those as best I can here. Find a way to pop that out. Okay, so I'll get to as many questions as I can. Start up here at the top. Uh, how much does it cost? I have both knees done at the same time. What would the cost be? Uh, Ruth, a lot depends on what technology we need to use. For instance, if you have mild arthritis, that would be more our super concentrated platelets. Um, that would be about $1,000. Uh, if it's uh, more significant arthritis, that's going to be uh, like a same-day same stem cell procedure. That's more in the four to $6,000 range. Karen, uh, which is better, to use your own stem cells or from another source? Um, uh, Karen, there aren't any other stem cells from any other source being sold or used in the U.S. Um, so, um, again, as I, I tried to show, the folks that are offering amniotic stem cells aren't offering any stem cells. They're, they're actually injecting dead tissue. Um, so whether or not the dead tissue works is another story, but they're not doing any kind of stem cell therapy. So there are no stem cells from another source being offered in the U.S., uh, which is better cells from blood or fat. There aren't really many stem cells in blood, um, and fat wouldn't be the way to go um, here for orthopedic problems. Uh, as I brought up in the presentation, um, 
uh, blood is mostly for platelet-rich plasma, and then animals or human umbilical cells. Um, again, no human umbilical cells are being offered in the U.S., um, and as far as animals are concerned, we wouldn't use animal stem cells in humans. Can stem cells from Biocord Bank be used? Uh, Quas. No, as far as I understand, the, the FDA regulations would not allow um, uh, blood or, or cord stem cells to be used for, for instance, osteoarthritis. Um, there's hope for a person suffering uh, with scoliosis, Karen. Uh, yes, Karen, we do treat a lot of scoliosis patients, uh, have, would have to know more specifics, but we do treat a lot of those patients. Uh, Kim, uh, how can I view as well as listen? Uh, so I, I think hopefully they all got figured out. It looks like uh, our sound check person said that everything sounds good. Um, Steve, uh, if a rotator cuff injury is old and retracted, could stem cells be injected with hopes that they might improve other injuries, torn labrum, arthritis, inflammation? Yeah, Steve, if there's a large retraction, we have treated a lot of patients like that, and they generally do reasonably well because we're treating all of the other things. Now, if there's a large, massive rotator cuff tear, I doubt the stem cells are going to heal it. Uh, they do well, work well in complete tears, not the massive retracted ones, though. Dan, uh, got it. How long uh, does the end of the treatment last? Is there a need for a follow-up? Yeah, Nancy, very good question. Uh, in general, for something like knee osteoarthritis, uh, if it's severe, patients would generally get follow-up treatments every couple of years. Um, when it comes to something like a knee ACL, um, the knee ACL is not something we generally retreat. It's kind of a one and done. Uh, Jason, um, your website uh, has a lot of clinical research. Can you talk about what the general success rate is for herniated discs, specifically L4-5 and L5-S1? Yeah, Jason, uh, the research I just showed on the PL disc procedure, that, that was done with many patients in that group who had herniated and bulging discs. So that's one you might want to go look at again uh, a little more closely. But um, generally high success rates for treating those types of problems. What does one measure effectiveness, how does one measure the effectiveness of treatment? Uh, yeah, Nancy, it just depends on what we're treating. So for something like severe knee osteoarthritis, we're going to rely on the person. Um, pain functional questionnaires. For something like a knee ACL, we'll, we'll do that, plus we'll look at an MRI. Uh, Jason, uh, how does the procedure help with those who may have tarsal tunnel? Um, yeah, Jason, that's, there's a, a couple good case reports of nerve-related issues. On the website, we generally use platelet lysate hydrodissection to treat tarsal tunnel. Um, it sounds like if you've got a back issue plus a tarsal tunnel problem, it's what we would call a double crush. So we would never treat one without treating the other. Mary, um, uh, is this available to listen at a later date? Um, so yes, Mary, I think we're recording this one. This one will be available. Um, Tracy, uh, Appreciate research would like to know what, if any place, lidocaine has in PRP stem cell injection. Um, yeah, Tracy, I wouldn't get lidocaine put in with any uh, PRP stem cell injection. It's toxic to stem cells and local tissues. Uh, we don't use lidocaine in any of the target tissues we're treating or around stem cells. We'll use, we, we will use ropivacaine, diluted, uh, which is safe around stem cells. Uh, but lidocaine and bupivacaine or marcaine are toxic to stem cells. Kim, uh, how can I be evaluated for your knee osteoarthritis study? Um, Kim, regrettably, you've missed out on that one. The knee osteoarthritis study is uh, no longer available at this point. Uh, it is uh, they've done recruiting uh, that was done in Chicago. So uh, unless there's some problem with the existing recruited patients, that one's closed. Um, Gordon, uh, are you using or planning to use stem cell therapy for maintaining, if not improving, general good health? No, Gordon, we don't do any general good health stem cell therapy. That's not us. Um, our focus is simply orthopedics. Uh, Brad, because there's, I presume, an adaption process for ASCs that is different from ACL grafts, et cetera, how different is physical therapy following these procedures as compared to post-surgical? Yeah, Brad, it's very, very different. Um, the rehab is about half or less, um, and the return to play time is about half or less um, with our procedure. 
In addition, much of the rehab after a traditional ACL injury is really just spent trying to get back to where you were because of the insult done by the surgery. Uh, there's very little of that with this procedure, so the return to play time is much, much quicker. Kim. Um, so yeah, Kim, I, I believe uh, staff will be posting this particular uh, webinar on the site so that everyone can see it. So there will be a video here. Uh, Mary, is the stem cell injection procedure effective for hips with loss of cartilage and good remaining bone integrity? Yeah, Mary, uh, we find that the culture procedure down in Grand Cayman is generally better for that kind of hip than a same day. Uh, the same day for hips tend to, tends to work better when there's more mild arthritis. Larry, uh, what's the success rate for someone with AVN? I'm 38, have 180 degrees necrosis in the femoral head and no collapse. Yeah, Larry, the good news is that the that's a, that sounds like an ARCO grade 2 AVN, and that is something that is very successful. We tend to see high success rates with. Now, I'd be very careful because AVN can progress quickly. Um, uh, so that's something that if you're going to get it treated with stem cells, I would get it treated right away. We've treated uh, more than 100 patients um, who have hip AVN uh, with a procedure that places the stem cells into the bone. So we've got a lot of experience with that going back to about 2007. Uh, Kim, uh, is your new kind of collecting stem cells that has better outcomes um, for your facility, or is that the one that is only offered out of the country? No, Kim, the new kind of procedure that offers more stem, stem cells is a same-day procedure, and that procedure is done here uh, in the U.S. clinics um, as well as out of the country, but uh, it's also done here in the U.S. Uh, Marie, I'm having trouble talking with a same person. I've had an MRI sent from Nebraska. I want this procedure for my hip. Um, you know, Marie, uh, uh, just send me an email and I'll try to get your um, your stuff moving for you. Uh, my email is Centeno Office. That's C E N T E N O Office, one word at Centeno Schultz S C H U L T Z dot com. So Centeno Office at CentenoSchultz.com. That goes to my desk, and I'll, I'll try to help you. Um, Carol, how do you get the recorded version? Um, uh, staff will post a recorded version online. Uh, Doug, uh, what about a knee where some of the meniscus and cartilage have been removed? Yeah, Doug, that's most of the knees we treat, so that's not a big issue for us. Uh, Lorelei, uh, is there any benefit of having prolotherapy prior to having regenic SC treatment for arthritic knees? Um, yeah, Lorelei, the only reason we would use prolotherapy before is if there's a lot of instability in the knee. So there might be if the knee is very unstable. Um, Brad, are there differences in how cells are centrifuges compared to bedside systems? Uh, yes, Brad, we do a, a very, very different kind of isolation, um, one that isn't done by the bedside systems. Sharon, uh, do drugs like metformin affect outcome of your procedures? Does diabetes? Uh, yes, Sharon, regrettably, if you've got type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, um, we would really recommend that you clean that up before um, you get this procedure. And I know that may be difficult to do, but um, it will affect the, the outcome of a, a same-day stem cell procedure. We're fairly certain of that. Um, Susan, what are the potential side effects of the genetic procedure and the needs? Yes, yeah, Susan, if you look online, all of that stuff is reported. Uh, Bottom line is generally much less than you would see in um, something like a knee HA gel injection. Um, but all of that stuff's online. Uh, it's under uh, research. So if you go to uh, the website, um, let's see here. If you go to our website, I'll show you where, I'll show everyone where a few things are on the website. So. Uh, the blog is a great place to um, take a look at all of the latest and greatest news um, about Regenix. That's off in the, up in the right-hand corner here. Find a physician is obvious. Obviously, that's where you can find a Regenix physician all around the country. Um, and then if you go to um, the FAQs, obviously, that's frequently asked questions. If you go to research, you can go under this research overview. This is all of our research papers that we've published, you click on one of these and you, you can get more information on that research. Uh, under research and uh, procedure outcome and safety data, 
that's where you'll find the safety information. So this is all the information we have. Uh, knee osteoarthritis, uh, knee meniscus, uh, hip arthritis, uh, shoulder, hand, wrist, foot, low back, and then stem cell procedure safety down here is where you would find that. And then uh, lots of other information here as well, the Regenix videos, um, SD uh, overview, et cetera. So lots of information on that site. And so I'd encourage you to go take a look at that. Um, above message meeting, same day as opposed to culture. Yeah, I think I got that one. Sherry, um, what is the cost of the stem cell injections for knee arthritis? I think I've talked about that up there. Uh, Masuma, uh, is ELISA used at other Regenix clinics beside yours? Yeah, Matsuma, the goal with uh, ELISA is we use it for a research. Uh, so, so our focus is there using it for research purposes, not clinically. Um, so, uh, for instance, I just put on some information the other day about, you know, this, it's a new multiplex uh, microarray array ELISA that we just purchased for the research lab. Now, obviously, the research that we do in that research lab in Colorado is eventually uh, goes to learn more that goes out to all the different clinics around the country. Um, so we're not using ELISA clinically. Uh, we're using ELISA for research purposes to try to improve the procedure. Uh, Marie, uh, I may have some sciatica pain in addition to hip arthritis. Do you do one at a time. No, Marie, we, we definitely treat both of those. We believe that we've got to treat the hip and the low back at the same time to be successful. Um, Ian, um, do we have any um, uh, hypotheses about why certain procedures do better with culture than others? Yeah, Ian, there's an interesting paper, for instance, in hip that shows that the hip uh, actually doesn't have as many progenitor cells or stem cells in it naturally. Uh, as compared to the knee. So that might explain why the why hips are a little more difficult to treat when they get severe. It might also explain why hips tend to uh, degenerate much more quickly than knees. Um, and it, it may explain a lot of things. Um, Daria, um, are insurance companies covering the costs? If not, you anticipate this will change in the near future. You know, Daria, I don't think that insurance companies will cover this anytime soon. It's certainly possible that we may see insurance coverage in the next five year horizon, but I think that's that's less likely than more. Catherine, I assume these procedures are not covered by insurance and Medicare. So again, I think I've answered that one. Carol, I was diagnosed with a complex regional pain syndrome affecting mainly my right foot. Can stem cell procedures help? Yeah, Carol, we have treated complex regional pain syndrome more with some of the platelet-based procedures than stem cell procedures. Um, and we've had some fairly good results in some difficult cases, um, but that's more that would, for us that would be more of a specialty treatment than something we do a ton of. Um, but yes, we have treated those kinds of patients. Um, uh, David, I have an arthritic knee which is getting worse. I have pain in the center of the knee and more limited range of motion uh, than my good knee. Will the procedure be good for me? Yeah, David, we'd have to know what's going on. To do that, we'd have to take an MRI to be able to see. Um, our process, though, that brings up a good point, is we would get on the phone with you and try to see if this is a good match for what you've got after we have that MRI. Uh, Catherine, um, uh, is the culture treatment not done in the US only? Yes, so the culture treatment, Catherine, is only done down in Grand Cayman. Uh, it is not done in the US. Um, Kim, uh, what type of injections do you say were best for the spine as opposed to steroid injections? Yeah, Kim, it just depends on what's going on with the spine. There are 20 things that can go wrong with the spine. Um, and, you know, for each of those, we would use a different technology. So our focus would either be using your own blood platelets or the growth factors from your blood platelets or your own stem cells, uh, same day or cultured, depending on what's going on. Uh, Catherine, where can I go to be evaluated? Catherine, if you go to the website and that find a physician area that I showed you, that's a good place to go to get evaluated. Uh, David, um, does the PRP procedure include always all three PRP stem cell and prolotherapy for patient degenerative disc and moderate to very painful back pain? How do you determine if the PRP prolotherapy is necessary? 
Yeah, David, um, again, we, we apply lots of different technologies depending on what's wrong with the patient. Uh, there isn't a one size fits all for anybody. Uh, Michael, um, can both hips, both knees, and lower back arthritic conditions be handled in one treatment using the Grand Cayman option? Um, in general, yes. Um, it's more likely that we would have enough stem cells to do that at Grand Cayman than anywhere else. Uh, David, after treatment for my knee, how soon can I resume normal walking? Yeah, David, we encourage normal walking at uh, actually day three after the procedure. Lorelei, how does this compare to a cortisone shot for the knee for arthritis? Yeah, Lorelei, a cortisone shot is pretty destructive, meaning it hurts cartilage cells. Um, and uh, so we don't do cortisone shots for knees anymore. We haven't done them for a long time. Um, so it, it's very, very different. Uh, that's catabolic, meaning it destroys things. These injections are anabolic. The goal is to build things. Uh, Kim, uh, I've read your book and wonder how the out-of-state eval over the phone would be to be able to do the physical screenings that are explained in the book. How do you allow for this for an eval? Yeah, Kim, we, we don't do those physical screenings in, in an evaluation on the phone at all. Our focus on, a, on the phone eval is simply to look at, are you a good candidate for this kind of procedure? Is this a good fit or probably not a good fit? Now, that is always obviously uh, changed by or modified by a physical exam. We might ultimately do the physical exam and say, you know what, we didn't really, uh, we really don't think you're as good a candidate as we thought you were over the phone. Or we might say, we think you're a much better candidate than we thought you were over the phone. So realize that there's an awful lot we can't do over the phone. Uh, Michael, if the Grand Cayman option is chosen to collect stem cells, are the injections also done in Grand Cayman? Uh, yeah, so there, that's an excellent point, Michael. You have to make two trips down there, one to take cells, the other to uh, get the cells put back, and that's usually done on a one to two month cycle. Um, Kim, what's the difference now comes between Regenix uh, SD and C? Yeah, Kim, uh, it's a very good question. For knees, there isn't a huge difference. For hips, there is. So it really depends uh, based on body area. Um, Jerry, uh, what about the nerve block? I'm looking for a provider in Nassau or Suffolk, New York. Um, Jerry, not quite sure what you're talking about. Maybe you're talking about my recent blog post on an MRI nerve block for soft tissue things. Um, you know, we have providers that are very good with musculoskeletal ultrasound uh, in that area. Um, you might look up Dr. Malanga's practice in uh, New Jersey. You'll find that on our site. Uh, that's M-A-L-A-N-G-A. -A -A. Uh, those guys have some excellent musculoskeletal ultrasound experts who can do uh, ultrasound guided nerve blocks. Um, uh, Quaz, yes, uh, the, uh, copy of this will be available. Um, uh, so same day is about 4,000 uh, approximately, Jerry. Uh, Daria, uh, how this, has the procedure been successful with patients with MS? Uh, Daria, we don't use or treat uh, this procedure uh, for MS. We don't treat MS. So our focus is orthopedics only. So we, we would not be that clinic who could help you with your MS and your knees, nor do we think that the clinics that do both are, are credible. Uh, Michael, uh, what's the cost for both hips, both knees, and lower back done at the same time? Yeah, Michael, that would depend a lot on the number of cells. The only place you could probably do that would be down in Grand Cayman, and those prices are, are higher than the U.S. SD treatment. Uh, what treatment do you think Peyton Manning had? Steve? Yeah, it's a very good question, Steve. Um, not quite sure. Uh, I've never met anyone that's figured out what treatment that uh, Peyton Manning had for his neck. Um, and so un unsure there, um, knee arthritis, uh, does the cartilage grow back? Yeah, Kim, for severe knee arthritis, you're not going to see large structures of cartilage grow back. That's generally not how this procedure would, would work. Now for small holes in the arthritis, that is something that we've seen MRI evidence of, of cartilage regrowth. Uh, Ralph, bone lesion on tibia with bone on bone, what's the prognosis for knee? Yeah, the bone on bone uh, isn't too much of a concern. If the bone lesion you're talking about is a bone marrow lesion or BML, uh, then that's again, something we can treat. Stacy, uh, uh, yeah, Stacy, uh, FDA approval is, doesn't apply to a same day procedure. Um, and in addition to that, 
uh, uh, covered by insurance takes a long time. So you're not gonna see any stem cell procedure or PRP covered by insurance for a while. Um, the good news is I think we'll start to see PRP in general for things like elbow tendonitis get covered by insurance uh, here in the next couple of years, somewhere in there, just because that's all based on the amount of, of research that's been done versus uh, the amount of demand. Uh, Jason, um, when culturing stem cells in the Cayman Islands, was a percentage increase in the volume of stem cells? Yeah, Jason, not so much the volume, but we can get about 100 to 1,000 X, or they get down there about 100 to 1,000 X more stem cells. Um, R. Zafslin, uh, knee away, uh, where is the injection done? My doctor offered to do stem cell injection in the arm. Is the same effect as into the knee? No, your doctor's a quack, run. Um, yeah, I hate to I hate to put it that way, but a stem cell injection in your arm is not going to help your knee. In fact, there's something called a pulmonary first pass effect, where about 99.9% .9 of those stem cells will never make it to the knee. 97% of them will be caught in the lungs. So again, uh, if a doctor is telling you he can give you a stem cell injection in your arm, he's doing it because he knows how to do the injection in the arm. He doesn't know how to do the injection in the knee. And, and that's a quack, just, just run away from there. Stacy, um, every doctor has to have a first patient. Who do your practitioners practice on? Yeah, Stacy, we do cadaver uh, work here, but it's a very good question. Um, so we have extensive cadaver labs where we teach them how to do these procedures. Uh, and they're also also available to come, uh, or we'll, we're available to have them come do patients with us as well. Mary, if you go to Caymans, how long do you need to plan on being there for culture and procedure? Yeah, Mary, the initial uh, trip is not very long, just a day or two. Uh, the follow-up trip um, can be short or long, depending on whether or not you get the pre and post stem cell injections done here in the States. Um, Larry, what is the cost of the AVN surgery and is covered by insurance? No, Larry, uh, not, no insurance coverage, uh, about the same cost as a same day procedure. Uh, Steve, uh, will stem cell treatment improve on L5S1 surgery that's 30 years old? Um, yeah, Steve, um, we would have to look at that. If the disc is collapsed, no amount of stem cells in the disc is going to help. Our focus would be trying to stabilize the instability help the joints and improve the function of the nerve. Um, let's see, all procedures have complications. One of the most common for labral tear in the hip. Yeah, Stacy, uh, best thing to do is to look online. As far as complications for a labral tear in the hip, they would be the same as any injection, meaning there's no increased complications that we've seen because we're injecting stem cells. So the same as any hip injection, just like the injection that you got to do, uh, for instance, the contrast um, with the MRI. Um, Mary, do we have Canadian physicians? Regrettably, Mary, we haven't cracked that one yet. We do not have any Canadian physicians. Um, uh, Sherry, no, again, no insurance coverage. Uh, Stacy, any sources of data that are not from your website but are peer reviewed? Yeah, Stacy, we have 15 peer reviewed publications or so. Those are on the website. So those have all gone through peer review. Um, in fact, one of them wasn't even done by us. It was done by a, a, a European research group on what we do. So I encourage you, uh, again, to go look at those. Uh, again, just to show you where those are, because uh, that's an important question, is if you go to research, and then you go under research overview, oops, so down over to research overview, um, and click on that and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see all of our different studies that we've published. Many of these, for instance, will go off to um, the actual paper when it can. So this is our recent uh, peer-reviewed research paper on ACL tears, uh, to give you an idea. Um, Aline, uh, I have knee osteoarthritis and have been told I need joint replacement for both knees. I saw there was a provider in Minnesota. When might Medicare help with the cost of the procedures? Elaine, yeah, the, Elaine, you're not going to, uh, th these procedures are not going to get Medicare coverage anytime soon. Uh, Stacy, uh, do you make money off my stem cells using them for other purposes? No, Stacy, we don't use uh, or sell any stem cells uh, that are the patients uh, and used for other purposes. Uh, Ned, uh, any inter interaction with gout? Yes, Ned, 
We have treated gout patients before, uh, not as a primary uh, treatment, but as arthritis secondary to gout. Jerry, uh, what part of the body is the stem cells taken from? That's the PSIS area on the back of the hip. Um, let's see, uh, do you need to keep redoing a uh, stem cell procedure for hip labral tears? Generally not. Um, uh, Al, what would the typical number of arthritis for uh, treatment for low back degeneration? Um, you know, it depends again, Al, on what we're treating. But for instance, if we were going to treat degenerative disc disease, generally those patients would get three to four treatments. Um, what is the cost for an in-person consult? Um, generally, Stacy, in-person consult, consults here, as well as many of the network sites are covered by insurance. So that's usually an insurance thing. If you don't have insurance, generally that the cost is approximately a couple hundred dollars. Carol, um, if cortisone injection has been done in the knee, does this have an effect on the success of a stem cell injection? Yeah, Carol, we wouldn't do a stem cell injection for about three months after a, a cortisone injection due to the damaging effect of the cortisone on the local stem cell population in the knee, as well as on the cartilage. Um, Kim, how does it help with knee arthritis if it doesn't grow back cartilage? Yeah, Kim, I know you're going to find this really hard to believe, and a lot of patients do, but we have no credible research that shows that, that knee pain has anything to do with lost cartilage. Knees hurt for lots of different reasons, but lost cartilage isn't one of them. So the two most recent longitudinal cohort studies, the Osteoarthritis Initiative and the Framingham Knee Osteoarthritis Study, both show that loss of cartilage doesn't cause pain. Um, so our goal is, is in a severely arthritic knee is not to regenerate cartilage. It's to reduce all the things inside the knee, the toxic stew of nasty chemicals that are causing pain. Uh, Stacy, my husband had a stem cell transplant for cancer. They harvested and grew his cells in the USA, one of not being done Grand Cayman. Um, yeah, Stacy, they probably didn't grow his cells to larger numbers unless that was part of some sort of clinical trial. Um, they may have certainly taken a lot of cells out and stored them and then put them back after radiation, and that is allowed. Uh, Rachel, patient has cardioregular heart fibrillation, she a candidate for knee stem cell. Um, yeah, that's generally something we would look at. Certainly, um, we would need to know a little more, but this is not like a knee replacement, meaning that um, it is not, it's not something that uh, is going to cause a lot of cardiac risk. Um, cost of a Regenix PL. Uh, yeah, Sharon, that's generally uh, one of our le lesser expensive procedures. Normally, we can get some of that covered by insurance, and there's usually about a $500 to $1,000 upcharge on top of that. Um, would SD work for carpal tunnel? Yeah, Jerry, uh, we... We wouldn't use SD for carpal tunnel, but we do uh, perform what's called platelet lysate hydrodissection. So we tend to use platelet growth factors. Stacy, do you use radioactive fluoroscopy? Um, yeah, it is x-ray. Um, and we only use fluoroscopy in areas that uh, ultrasound underperforms in or ultrasound can't be used, uh, or at least it can't, you can't do a good job with ultrasound. Uh, Robert, is there any pain in the hip bone after stem cells have been taken? Yeah, Robert, most patients feel like they've been kicked in that area for a while uh, after that type of procedure. Um, so they're, they're a little sore for a couple days after, but it's not a severe problem. Some patients don't feel much at all. Masuma, um, can post-ST injection, six weeks PRP injection, reveal improvements from the earlier procedure? Um, yes, sometimes a, a, a what we call a platelet, um, a platelet, Booster shot can help a lot. Um, Sharon, can the stem cells become cancer cells? You know, no, Sharon, that's not something we've seen at all, either with same day or cultured cells. Um, so it's not something that we, we have seen any evidence of at all. And there's all sorts of good reasons why this stem cell type would not be associated with that. Etrogenics Clinic is aiding by the same, abiding by the same stem cell procedure for harvesting stem cells. Yes, Tracy, they, they are. Um, Larry. What is the time to get an appointment? Uh, yeah, Larry, that is really variable on who you want to see. I, I'm probably the farthest booked out of anybody, but obviously that's different for each doctor. Um, Stacy, beside the fact that anyone would rather do anything on a Caribbean island, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, guys, well, 
Uh, I'm going to start to wrap this up. I, I have, you've all put in some great questions. Um, I'm going to go home and have some dinner with my family. So I really appreciate you taking the time out. I know it's difficult to find this time. Um, and um, it's been wonderful just educating you about these things. If you have any need for follow-up, uh, go ahead and send a, a, a message to staff. Um, they can go ahead and, and try to get your questions answered. If they can't answer them, then they'll usually send them to me. Um, in addition, you know, by all means, check out our provider network. We've got some great providers all over the country. So thank you very much for your time, and I will uh, now sign out here, uh, and uh, we'll get we'll get going on here. Thank you much.